All right, hello. Great, yeah, th thanks uh, for uh, to everyone uh, who's joined. We're, we're extremely privileged to have uh, one of the leaders in, uh, in computer science, uh, Len Adelman, uh, inventor of so many great things, obviously of the RSA in encryption method, uh, the creator of the RSA Security Incorporated, and also the father of uh, DNA uh, computing. And in 2002, awarded the Turin Prize. So this is actually our second Turin Prize winner uh, this semester. So we're very proud. We had uh, Marty Hellman. We also had Tahir uh, Elgamo. Uh, we've had Niall Col Koblitz uh, with us. And obviously Bruce oh. Snyder <laughs> came along and gave us uh, his opinions. Mm. So we've had some great speakers, but we we kept the best one to last, uh, we, we think. Uh, so it's great, great to have you along. And we've obviously been studying public key encryption and RSA is such a fundamental part of the security, trust and privacy of the internet. So I'm going to start a way, way back. Uh, May so I uh, amend one yeah. thing? Go, go, go uh, ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I want to uh, alter one thing. I don't, I'm no longer a leader in the field. I think I, I, I'm a far trailer. Uh, so, yeah, I haven't kept up. Uh, yeah. At any rate, still a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and I mean, I think everyone is in a similar situation. I mean, obviously, we 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 write papers and then we move on and so on. But you just your whole career has been one of of invention and creation of 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 new things. So we go back to you growing up in San Francisco, and I think it was your it was your high school English teacher who showed you the beauty of reading through Hamlet. <laughs> what was that beauty? Uh, I think she revealed for me uh, that uh, there was more to the world than was superficially available, that there were somehow deeper things. Uh, you know, I uh, one could read a comic book about Hamlet and uh, uh, understand the story, of course. Uh, but uh, she exposed deeper uh, concepts, uh, you know, to be or not to be, yes. Uh, there's a lot in that yeah. and a lot of interpretations. Uh, yeah. So she was fundamental. She also did something that was kind of surprising and maybe of interest to the students. I was in high school, you know, I was probably 16, 17 when I took her course. And uh, she called me up after class and she said, what are you gonna do after you graduate? And I said, I don't know, I'll probably go to college. I, I was a very unenlightened person. And, uh, and so she, she said, well, what, what college are you thinking of? And I said, well, my brother went to San Francisco City College, a local community college. So I guess I'll go there. And she said, uh, you should go to Berkeley. And I said, okay, <laughs> that's what I did. But it was a you know sort of critical turning point in my career, my life. Um, but it meant very little to me at the time she suggested it. Yeah, I, th I think we all look back on the teachers who inspired us, inspired us, and maybe we didn't end up in the subject areas that they that they actually taught us. So I think you went you went to the University of California at Berkeley, and you wanted to be a chemist, as I remember. I, is, I that, did. is that true? Yes, it, it was true because I had a little history in chemistry. Uh, I and my friends. Uh, used to try to build things that would explode, tri-nitro iodine, for example. And uh, we weren't tremendously successful. Uh, but uh, one, one year, probably it was 17 or something, my father got me a job as a chemistry assistant in a laboratory in San Francisco. 
And it was in an old wooden building that uh, had existed prior to the famous 1906 earthquake. And uh, it was right upstairs from a pub. Uh, and their specialty was petroleum products. And uh, they had five gallon jars from all the local uh, petroleum companies in the area, of which there were a lot. And they were supposed to check them out. And uh, it turned out to be a thrilling experience because I actually, uh, in the course of my work, managed to light the place on fire. <laughs> and uh, yes, you know, it would have been a disaster of major proportions had it not been, you know, snuffed out by uh, me and others. The whole floor was up in flames, gallons of petroleum products. Anyway, yes, I did start out at, in chemistry. Uh, yeah, but then I sort of got lost. Yeah, you got lost. You did your PhD and so on. What, what was the thing that got you into cryptography? Oh, okay. Well, you know, the thing, uh, Martin Gardner, I don't know if any of your students are aware of him. Bill, are you aware of him? Yeah. Oh, very much. I, I'll come back on to Martin Gardner. I'm reading, I'm hearing all these audible uh, podcasts just now, going through all his papers again. We'll come back on to that, but I, I don't know of Martin so well. He, he inspired me. He inspired, you know, yeah. a generation or two of mathematicians, computer scientists and like. He also inspired me. And one of the things he would write about these amazing sort of mysteries like uh, black holes in space, uh, relativity, uh, quantum mechanics. And he, he also wrote on girdling completeness. And uh, I was working at a bank at the time. Uh, and I would read these things and I said, you know, one time in my life, I would like to understand one of these, these topics, these grand mysteries or phenomenal finds, uh, more than just what you can talk about at a cocktail party. I wanted to really learn what it was all about. And it turned out that uh, the one I had the opportunity to do that uh, for was uh, mathematical logic, girdle stuff. And once you start down that road, you're basically being a computer scientist of the 1930s. And uh, that was a critical, critical juncture in my moving in that direction. Yeah. And so he, he, he talked about prime numbers and he really brought them alive. And obviously the prime number theory led to RSA. And I think he published the paper that caused controversy oh, yes. around, around RSA. Yes. So there was a lot of tensions about whether the, the paper should be sent out. Uh, I think he yeah. asked to send a stamped addressed envelope and we'll send you the paper. But I think right. there was a lot oh, of people oh. who were unhappy. Uh, well, I, I, I'll i recount that. So once I had started in down the road of mathematical logic and girl incompleteness, uh, I quickly discovered a new thing that had been sort of thrown into the mix and that was complexity theory computational complexity, how, how long it took to compute certain functions. And so I ended up getting my PhD in that under a, another grand teacher, Manuel Blum. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up, my first job was at MIT as a mathematics professor of some kind. And uh, uh, there I encountered two other people, one who had come the same year I came, Adi Shamir, and one who had been there a year, uh, Ron Revest. And it was a, a lovely place and a lovely experience. And we were buddies and did a lot of research together. And uh, uh, so uh, one day I walked into uh, Ron's office and he held up this manuscript and he said, 
did you see this thing by these guys at uh, Stanford, Marty Hellman and, uh, uh, Bill Oh, did, uh, yeah. And with, yeah, with, yeah. <laughs> with, with, yes. And, uh, and so he started to talk about what it was about, something about you could scramble messages so no one could read them and everything. But I had, you know, gone the pure math way and had a certain probably arrogance at the time that, well, that was all nice, right? But, you know, Gauss said we should work on uh, algorithms for primes. So I wasn't interested, but eventually uh, they sort of, Adi and Ron uh, dragged me kicking and screaming into uh, their investigations. And they would come up with one crypto system after another, and they'd all fail. This was an attempt to get a public key crypto system. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, this went on, and for reasons we understand better now than we did then, the algorithms that they came up with started to move into number theory. Just they had a number fee, uh, theoretic flavor as opposed to, for, say, a graph theoretic approach. And uh, um, it just so happens that, you know, nobody really cared, but for the, you know, well, maybe five people in the world cared about algorithmic number theory. And I was your go-to man at MIT if you happen to care. And so these things all uh, sort of started falling in my uh, area of expertise, and I could knock off their attempts to find this public yeah. key crypto system time and time again. Well, uh, one day, uh, Ron remembers none of this, by the way, uh, <laughs> but it was Passover in 77 or something, 78, I don't know. Uh, and uh, Ron had drunk a lot of Manischewitz wine and uh, he called me sometime around midnight and he says, Len, what about, and he went on to describe what is now the RSA system. And I said, hey, you know, I think that's, that actually could work. And uh, congratulations, Ron, good night. And I, I think it was the very next day I came in and he handed me a manuscript. And I looked at it briefly and I said, well, you know, this is obviously what we talked about last night. And he's, and I looked at it and the authorship was uh, Adelman Rivesh Shamir, ours. And, uh, uh, you know, that was sort of the default alphabetical. So I, I said to Ron, take my name off this paper. It's your invention. And so we got in a little argument and we decided we'd sleep on it. And then I think it was the next day we said, well, I, I said, well, I'll tell you what, make me third author, hence RSA. And uh, the RSA uh, idea probably first really saw light when Martin Gardner thought it was a cool thing to uh, put in his column in Scientific American. And he did that, and uh, uh, he also included our offer that anybody who sent a self-addressed stamped envelope, you guys will have to Google that concept. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, it was a thing. And uh, uh, anyone who did that, uh, we'd send a, a manuscript that we had prepared prepared yeah. a tech report uh, out to you. And so I was at Berkeley in a bookstore and uh, I was in line and there was this guy who was buying Scientific American. I didn't know, you know, when or if it would actually appear our stuff. So uh, he, as he's checking out and I'm right behind him next to check out, he says to the cashier, did you see this thing about this new secret code or something? Mm -hmm. And the cashier says, 
yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> and I figured out, you know, what they must be talking about. And, you know, in youthful exuberance, and uh, I said, oh, that's our stuff. So the guy who had the Scientific American asked me to sign. Wow. Sign it. <laughs> now, you know, you probably think that uh, mathematicians are constantly, you know, uh, accosted by people seeking autographs and were followed by paparazzi and stuff like that. <laughs> but it had never happened to me. And I never even considered that it might. And, uh, and I said to myself, what's going on here? And we got back to, when I returned to MIT, uh, a bunch of graduate students were on the floor in Rivest's office and outside Rivest's office. Mm -hmm. And they were stuffing envelopes with, uh, you know, a, a copy of our paper. And uh, I did notice uh, like thousands, you know, or maybe a one or 2,000 different requests we got. And I did notice that uh, they seemed to be coming from sort of strange places. And I don't remember exactly, but roughly speaking, it was like the Bulgarian uh, Service for Information or something like that. <laughs> you know, all these, wait a minute. So, um, yes. Should I stop here, Bill, and let you get a... No, a, no, 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 please, please continue on, because I know there were some people who weren't happy it was going to the Bulgarian yes. secret intelligence and so on. <laughs> That's right. So uh, I was even more, you know, like, what is the deal with this, this code? And uh, uh, so then we got a letter, which we la later learned was from an agency called the NSA, uh, an employee of the NSA, which we later learned stood for uh, National uh, Security Agency, which we later learned uh, uh, was basically unknown to anybody but a small cadre of government officials and people presumably at work there. And I would, when they talked about it, uh, the word was, they called it no such agency. And uh, it will, you guys know what the NSA is now. It's yeah. the black chamber, the historic word for the place where codes are made and enemy codes are broken. Uh, it's the black chamber of the US. Uh, so at any rate, um, the letter said, you can't send this manuscript out of the country. It's against the law. And I said, against the law? <laughs> you know, what is this? What is going on? And uh, it turned out that that was, you know, the beginning episode of, I suspect what still goes on uh, between the academic world and the National Security Agency. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a thrilling thing to watch and participate in. And, uh, yeah, that's how that particular path stemmed from it. And that's amazing. You would call it the crypto wars. Uh, and, and you're right, it still goes on. And, and uh, uh, law enforcement agencies are still looking for backdoors that really aren't, aren't going to be possible mathematically. So they're trying to find lots of other ways to, to actually break the uh, tunnels and the ciphers and so on. Yeah. And so, I, so, I, I oh, say, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, uh, what is the relationship today among, you know, the secret agencies, the black chambers and the academic world? Uh, it transformed while I was still involved quite a bit, but is there, um, is it still the case that people who want to go into computer security and crypto in particular uh, have an option of taking the path of secret agencies or going academic or in now, of course, industrial? 
And they could. I think you find a lot of people in cryptography uh, go into industry. They they get involved in startup companies, and their skills are highly prized. People who can do the maths and the coding, uh, and also the formalization, is highly prized in a lot of these startup companies. But when it comes to breaking the crypto, then obviously the endpoints become an attack. Uh, there is a concept uh, called, uh, 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 I forget the term, but to, to join a conversation uh, in the background so that they don't actually see the other the agency as, as part of the, the communication, as part oh, of the, okay. the group. Uh, so there are, there are methods that uh, obviously law enforcement can use, but they are really scared about the end-to-end -end encryption uh, that actually happens. So with that, I say, uh, obviously, it's changed a lot. Uh, I think the E-value uh, changed from three up to 65,000-odd and so on. But it's generally coped very well with uh, our scale-up, and it's still one of the most highly used public key encryption methods and mm. signature methods, elliptic curve came along, but it's still yes. the rock solid core of public key encryption on the internet and, and for core trust. Did you think it was going to last that long? Did you, did you really know how big this would be? No, uh, I didn't. And I was very slow to pick up on this. And, uh, uh, but uh, I was told that I was going to be rich. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'm still, you know, some low grade professor at MIT making a subsistence wage. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not rich. I'm not close to it. And, uh, and I'm told I'm going to be rich. So I said, okay, I'm going to buy a brand new red, because I was a young man. Uh, red uh, Toyota. You yeah, know, it's kind of slick looking. <laughs> this is the seventies, and yeah. uh, and so I did that, uh, and I paid for it with monthly payments wow. uh, till it was all paid up. the The big windfall of money had, had not arrived as promised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. that's that that's amazing, and. I you moved from MIT to to Southern University of Southern California. I mean, you had you had such a great team at MIT, and obviously things were going really well for you. What? Why? Why did? Why did you move? Was it the weather? It, it, the weather was a big part of it. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, I wasn't very good in you know what is it, acculturating. I knew I was in trouble because I, when I first pulled in, having driven across the country to Cambridge, I uh, went to a McDonald's and I ordered, you know, Big Mac, fries and a Coke. And she, the cashier, uh, you know, we, I paid, she brought out this stuff and she handed it to me and I stood there. I didn't know why, but I stood there and stood there and stood there. And she goes, next. And I realized that I was waiting for her to say, have a nice day. Yeah. <laughs> because in California, they always said, have a nice day. But in Boston and Cambridge, that kind of politeness was not valued very much. And uh, so anyway, I had cultural problems. So I wanted to get back to California where I'd been born. Yeah. And at, at the time in, the, in uh, Clifford Cox and James Ellis at GCHQ were working on things. And unfortunately, they weren't recognized at the time. What did you know about their work at that time? Knew nothing about it uh, at the time we were working, but learned about it later, of course, and uh, uh, I've always admired those guys. You know, they um, they had to forego, you know, the prizes and all the rewards that we got, but they did it because, you know, they were more dedicated to security of the country. 
And uh, uh, so, yes, I, I hold them in high esteem. I don't think I've ever met any of them, but anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the RSA paper was the first paper to outline A and B. So A talks to A, to B and will sign. And they yeah. became known as, as Bob and Alice. You can see Bob and Alice here. Oh, you got them. <laughs> where, yeah. where, where, where did the Bob and Alice okay. come from? Okay, yeah. And by the way, it's apparently spread into physics and, you know, quantum physics, things. Right, yeah. they got all those Alice and Bob's. And of course, there's a whole host of other characters, Eve yeah. or Eve Stropper. I'm proud of one I introduced that nobody cared about. I had a buyer and seller. So I called them Byron and Shelley. Oh, wow. Like from the classics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I deserve credit for that. Anyway, yeah. no. Uh, so, um, yes, here's what happened with Alice and Bob. So in the earliest sort of manuscripts uh, about RSA, they were just called A and B. And we sent out uh, an early draft to a algorithmic number theorist named Richard Schrappel. Mm -hmm. And we asked him to look over the paper and advise us on our estimations of how fast factoring could be done at that time. And because uh, he, he was a specialist in, in that sort of thing. And uh, so what happened was he, he did advise us, and I, I want to get back to that, uh, mm -hmm on how fast factoring could be done. But he also took the liberty to make some editorial comments. And he said, well, you know, I found it somewhat confusing because you had mathematical symbols, A, B, X, Y, and you had this A and B, and I sort of thought they were mathematical sim symbols. You know, maybe you should, these agents should be distinguished by giving them names to avoid that confusion. And he suggested uh, Adolf and Boris. <laughs> and I rather, you, you know, obviously Adolf would have been a big mistake, uh, but I did like his idea of making the names a little more you know, richer or less, you know, less simple than Alice and Bob, because to me, Alice and Bob sounded too much like a children's book, Jack and Jill. Uh, at any rate, but yes, so be thankful it's not Adolf and Boris. All right, that's good. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we've known a Boris in the UK, and, and we've associated oh, yes, it yes. not with cryptography, yeah. but with politics. Uh, yes, but yes. that's a whole other story. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> people like Whitfield Diffie, Marty Helm, and Klaus Snor all patented their innovations, and uh, Tahir didn't, uh, uh, on the advice of Mar Marty Hellman. And I think David Kravitz. Uh, signed his patent to the US. You did patent the, R the RSA, and obviously you, you've done very well uh, from it. Uh, yeah. So I think it was right to do it. Sometimes in crypto cryptography, things have been held back. Do you think RSA was ever held back by the patent? No, I don't think it was. And I always yeah. thought that it was one of my better ideas. You know, I didn't um, yeah. come up with RSA, Ron did, but but one of my better ideas was uh, to seek a patent and uh, and to assign it to MIT. So it wasn't a personal patent yeah. because I thought that you know the three of us would have no chance of defending it against yeah. General Electric or Motorola or whatever these big companies were. But I thought that MIT had deeper pockets, but also these big companies had a multifaceted relationship with MIT. They got you know, great graduate students. They could come to campus and recruit. So I thought it was a, a degree of protection for us. And I think it did turn out that way. I also think 
I may be wrong about this, that that patent application was a sort of uh, important one in the history of uh, patents because um, the idea was at that time that you couldn't patent a mathematical formula. Yeah. And was RSA a mathematical formula? Well, no, we weren't patenting that. We were patenting its use in a crypto system. And uh, so it forced, uh, I think, you know, the patent office to start evaluating what are they going to do with software and things like that. Uh, at any rate, yes, we did patent it. And uh, uh, we formed a company in my, uh, my uh, one room apartment in Los Angeles. And it was sort of like, your students won't follow this, Mickey Rooney and, uh, and uh, I, I don't know whoever the woman was, you know, let's put on a show. So we said, let's put on a company. And Ron became the uh, chairman of the board and I became the president and Adi became everything else. And we signed documents and we formed this company. And uh, so I was president of RSA for, oh yes, thank you, uh, Craig. Judy Garland is correct. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, that's the other one. Uh, so uh, uh, we formed this company. I was the first CEO. I just, I would, I learned a few things. One is uh, that I was terrible as a businessman. And two is that being a good businessman is not easy. Uh, you've got to put up with such incredible amount of stress betrayal, lies, everything else. I mean, it is rough out there. And, you know, I wasn't good at any of those things. And so uh, I was CEO and I managed to drive the company to the verge of bankruptcy. <laughs> and it, it, it was really going to fold. And so Revest, who was a much better businessman than me, uh, Fired everybody we had hired. Uh, he, he was chairman of the board. He could do this. Uh, he fired everybody and kept one guy, Jim Bidsos. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, yeah, he, he became the head of RSA and he became the head of VeriSign. And, you know, he's got billions of dollars, I believe. And, um, but that guy was a great businessman. He was a great storyteller and everything. So um, uh, one of his first <laughs> things he did as, uh, as the new CEO was he called me and the company on paper owed me some money because I had written, you know, part of the code that was what they were selling at the time. And so they owed me, you know, let's say in today's dollars, 30,000 or something. Mm -hmm. And so Jim called me and he said, we'd like to give you five cents on the dollar for, to clear the debt. And I said, Jim, why would I do that? And he said, well, you're on the board. And if this company goes down, you can be sued. And I said, five cents on the dollar sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> and and uh, uh, so I immediately uh, resigned from the board because I wanted to get away from that and stayed away from the company for a very long time. Uh, again, I should give you the opportunity to intervene. I, I, yeah, no, it, it became a, a, an extremely successful company based on RSA yeah. and uh, 200 million uh, was sold to Dell uh, for, and it's now back independent again. It went through a is rocky it, time. Oh, yeah, really? I okay. think I think it went back uh, independent, but it went through a rocky time where they lost private keys and there was some trust issues and so on. So it probably just lost its way a little bit. 
but it was built of obviously on the RSA method. And, yeah. And when, when, when I talked to uh, Marty Hellman, he, he told me about the time. I mean, he said, you, you, you're a great cracker of things. You, you break things oh, yeah. so easily. And obviously that, that worked with it. And you broke the Merkel Hellman knapsack mm -hmm. method. Yeah. And that was obviously a contender to RSA. And he told us about the time, I don't know if you remember this, uh, that you were to I give a live remember. demo. Huh? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, this, yeah, I forgot. And, and also <laughs> there's this wonderful picture of the critical moment in the story I'm about to tell. Ah, is there? Yeah. So interesting. Uh, Adi Shamir had uh, had shown that uh, uh, because of a result in uh, lattices, which are in this case number theoretic objects, uh, due to Lenstra, Lenstra, and Lobosh, yeah. he had shown they had shown a way to do something fast that people didn't realize you could do fast polynomial time until they had done it. And Adi was able to say, wow, we could use that to break some simple crypto systems based on uh, knapsack. And so I, I had learned Adi's method and uh, saw that, you know, you could do it a, a variant that might be a little faster. And uh, uh, so, and and as a result of that, might be able to break some additional knapsack-based systems, including the uh, Diffie. What was it? No, it was Merkel. The yeah. Hellman, Hellman Merkel, Merkel, Merkel Hellman. Yeah, that was a paper. That's thing, right. Knapsack. That's yeah. right. So I went out and bought one of the early apples. You know, oh. Apple computers, <laughs> Apple, uh, Apple two or Apple one. Yeah, I think it was Apple two, probably. Yeah, I yeah, mean, that was a bit better than the first one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and another story, you know, which we can save is the first personal computer, and I. Okay. Yeah. But um, uh, so, uh, and I I programmed up breaking the uh, merkel hellman system yeah. and uh, every year in santa barbara there was a conference on crypto i bet it still goes on does it still go on yeah. uh, there's a real world crypto that that's, that that happens now uh, it's probably equivalent okay in Which santa can be barbara a bit wild uh I, no I, it's all over the world now but it can oh, get yeah. wild but I, I i heard that these were wild presentations that people would throw yes, bottles yes. and things yes so so uh yeah as i want you know the world never sets i mean the sun never sets on crypto conferences right <laughs> <laughs> they're, yeah. they're always going on all the time but uh so there was this, and they had something called rump sessions. And this is the one. Rump sessions, thing that's about. it. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. that's right. Where anybody could sort of talk about anything for a short period of time. And I had brought my Apple II to the conference. And on the first day, first rump session, I had challenged uh, the crowd right. to develop and I had written the programs for this, uh, to choose a key for merkel Hellman, yeah. And uh, they chose, and it was blind to me what they had chosen. And then I guess they sent the public key to me. And I said, well, I'm going to come back in 24 hours, because it took about 20 hours to break these things on um, the Apple II. And uh, and we'll see what happens. And I invited, I think it was Marty, to write down the key he had chosen on a transparency. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when I got the result that my computer said, I wrote that result on a second transparency. So there came a moment where in the second room session, Marty laid on an overhead projector 
the original key, and I laid over it my uh, what broken key. And I think I said something unfortunate. I, it could be taken, and I think it might have been the wrong way. I said, you know, now the uh, embarrassment will begin, by which I mean mine, as if it didn't yes. match. But I mean, you know, maybe Marty knew otherwise or took it the wrong way. And so that we put a cover sheet. All this was under a cover sheet so that we could, you know, have a reveal. And uh, the reveal showed that the two numbers, you know, two lines long and pretty large numbers uh, were the same. And the, uh, the so Merkel Hellman, you know, went down the drain. And with it, I think a whole bunch of, it, it, it may have had the effect of putting people off of knapsack-based systems altogether, but maybe not, I don't know. Um, uh, and, and as it happened, at the moment of the reveal, uh, somebody, I forget his name, took a photograph. Have you seen the photograph, Bill? I've not seen the photograph. That's exactly what Marty remembers, that that you said that. And at the time, he was a little upset, but he he knows now that this is what you meant, that your system might have crashed or might have given the wrong result. Uh, if you yeah. could send me the photograph, that would be amazing if you have it. Uh, I do have it. And uh, it's amazing because uh, Shamir was running the session. So he's right over <laughs> my shoulder as I'm pulling off this... Uh, you know, top sheet to reveal. And it also captures uh, Hellman, yeah. this one photograph and his response. Yeah. And I think he was sitting maybe next to Merkel or Witt. So yeah, it's a wonderful photograph. I will definitely send it to you. Uh, that's yeah. that 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 would be great. Yeah, it's nice to hear your side of it because obviously Marty does remember uh, that sequence, and uh, I think that excitement is the th kind of thing that Faraday used to use. He used to have these public engagement events, and he would create some amazing new things. He probably didn't know the whole theory of it, but you had to go along to see his wonderful inventions. Yes, uh, I, I don't know about Faraday in particular. Was he was he making frogs legs do things and stuff like that? Uh, no, I think he was doing electromagnetics and electrical theory, and he came up okay. with motors, and he would do these demonstrations in the evening that people would, would go along to, and it was such an exciting uh, time. Yes, so you uh, talked about yeah, Manuel Blum. Uh, was was your your advisor your 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 mentor? What was it about him that made him so, so inspiring? Uh, I think uh, he had picked up an a concept that uh, he instilled in me, and that was uh, to do amazing things. It's not that you can do amazing things on a regular basis, unless you're, you know, some people have, but um, uh, but he did he now we would call thinking outside the box, and uh, he didn't want to do things in the box. He didn't want to make incremental improvements. He wanted to, you know, find amazing new things. And he had succeeded in, in doing that himself. Uh, there's a theorem, probably not well known now, called the Lum speed up theorem, which is a remarkable thing. And, uh, and so he, he, he uh, instilled that in me. He also was just a great teacher. And I learned later from him that he was always terrified to walk into the uh, classroom. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that that that, you know, he worried about it. It kept him up at night. And yet he was this great teacher. And uh, I don't know about. Do, can you relate to that experience, Bill? No, I, I, I love teaching, but I, I do worry about it. Uh, and 
I, I do know that some people struggle uh, walking in front of a class, especially into a conference where there are distinguished professors and so on. I think when yeah. you're first presenting your research, it can be quite daunting. But if you know your topic and you know your students are friendly, then it can be easy, I think. Yeah, it, it's a joy when it works well. And, yeah. you know, if you prepare well enough, it usually does work yeah. well. But yeah. I and I can relate to that fear. Uh, so, uh, Manuel, I, I, yeah, like one time, so I would meet with Manuel one hour a week. Yeah. And uh, he had a lot of graduate students, great ones. And uh, uh, so, uh, I would go in and one day, because I had been bitten by this idea, I wanted to do great things, whatever exactly that was. I think it was, I think it was for Ma's last theorem, but it could have been the Riemann hypothesis. And I said to Manuel, I think I'm going to spend some time trying to prove, let's say it was for Ma's last theorem. And most advisors would sort of ease a young student away from that as a mm -hmm. you know initial kind of avenue. Uh, but Manuel said, "Yeah, that's great. I think you should do that." Wow. And so I think that you know sort of gave me the liberty of just you know walking, taking the road less traveled, maybe marching to my own drummer because yeah. Manuel said it was okay. So yeah, he's uh, he, yeah. he's a wonderful think, mentor. Yeah, I think Marty Hellman was very similar. He gave his students some leeway, some scope. He gave them yeah. problems and he, he let them develop. And obviously Tahir did amazing work with his work. So you're you're one of the few people that I know of that, that really has successfully crossed over from computing to biology. You have a real interest in biology and you moved from cryptography into DNA computing. So now the headlines are all about chat GPT uh, and that it's now, this is the great advance in AI. What's your feelings of how AI and machine learning are developing? <laughs> could could uh, you see some my, of your work coming alive? Uh, is it a well, false we, intelligence or a real intelligence? Uh, I like those questions. Um, <laughs> let, let me describe my feelings this way. When I was, you know, around the age I presume your students are now, uh, it was a topic of conversation that sometimes came up about, uh, you know, oh, whether machines would be intelligent, whether they might supplant us as the, you know, lit species on earth. And, and at, at, that was among discussions like, oh, How's the world going to end? And we became aware, you know, that, well, the sun was going to burn out. Yeah. You know, it was a long time ago. And, and uh, but I remember in both those instances that computers might supplant us uh, evolutionarily. Um, and the sun was going to burn out. <laughs> that they were of theoretical interest because it was going to be billions of years before any of that was going to happen. They weren't real things. Well, the sun hasn't burnt out. But on the other side of the coin, uh, I'm astonished at how fast AI is progressing. I mean, just amazed that it would reach this point in such a short period of time. And uh, yeah, and fascinated. Uh, as I think you know, Bill, I'm, always, uh, I'm writing a book about yeah. all this. Yeah. And uh, uh, the name of the book, which changes whenever I feel like it, uh, is now called uh, Darwin, 
Turing, Dawkins, building a general theory of evolution. Cool. And I, that's, that's yeah, go it's ahead. a good, it's a good group of people, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's perfect. I think it was Marvin Minsky who wrote around the emotion of the mind and the the society of the mind. I, I just wonder if if it's a fake intelligence that we see. It's a template approach. It's filling in the probabilities of the word. If I can find all the answers to the to your problems, then all I need to do is fill in the blanks. Is it a real I, intelligence? Do you think? Well, you know, of course, we can debate it. I don't know what a real intelligence is. I see people like saying, well, you know, pigs are more intelligent than dogs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, dogs are more intelligent than lobsters. But crows may be more intelligent than all of them. And, and uh, you know, it, the goal... Evolution does not, uh, survival of the fittest does not say you have to conform to what humans think intelligence is. I mean, who cares what humans think intelligence is? You know, a worm is as intelligent as it could be. And if you invested a lot in a much better brain so that the worm could play chess, he probably died because he wasn't you know, that, that's an extra burden of resources to keep that brain alive, and it never comes in handy for the worm. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's sort of the wrong question, as many questions are. And do I think that um, uh, computers that we will have, robots, maybe not in the form that, you know, science fiction tells us, that... Um, are able to succeed evolutionarily and perhaps succeed uh, in doing a lot of things we can't do? Absolutely. I, I mean, sure. Uh, I don't think there's any reason against it. And I think uh, uh, computers uh, follow Darwinian evolution and we, eventually we will have robots that uh, uh, are walking around with all of the internal conflicts and stress that we have, right? And they'll form political parties and they'll fight with each other. And just like we do, there's nothing. DNA, it, we may have served our purpose, genes, uh, as the scaffolding on which something else was built. And we may go away, and that's something else. Well, it might well be computer uh, things, robots, if, yeah. for want of a better word. What do you think, Bill? Ah, uh, yeah, I, 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 I do think there's a fake intelligence there. But, but obviously, if it starts to write research papers, then it's starting to look at really a first-level intelligence that you could get over the gate, that a peer-reviewed paper could be accepted from a bot there's nothing in it it's just that they happen to have crafted it in a certain way and it just looks right and i think our peer review process has reduced <laughs> from the days when you had the rsa paper where it would take years almost to get uh, published i think a lot of these things tend to be much more mechanical uh, but obviously there are jobs like in the legal industry and in administration that could actually go and it disrupts our world again like the calculator and and the internet and Google and so on. It's just like another challenge for us. And obviously jobs in healthcare, biology, as you say, are the jobs of the of the future, the green industries and so on. And it's well for the short we term. Lost, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Please yeah, go, go ahead. On. No, no, you, you go you, ahead. You. All right. Let's see. Lynn, since you're into my Uh, I'm not sure I understood that, but 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 anyway, it, it, in response to to Bill, um, I agree with you. All the things you've described will probably happen, but um, you know, why won't uh, 
it'll just keep going. There's nothing to keep it from going further other than, you know, the sun will blow up, might blow up and, you know, take the robots with it. Uh, but um, no, I, I think eventually, uh, eventually th these will be new species. Uh, I bothered to give them a name, Computitia, like bacteria and, you know. Uh, these will be new species that will have their own evolutionary destiny, and they're very likely to survive. The critical point for me is when will they be able to reproduce without humans? That is, right now, we're in a... Uh, a relationship with computers that is is a lot like uh, th there's a word in biology for it. Uh, I forget the word, but we both need each other because if the computer stopped tomorrow, us humans may not survive as a species. Maybe we will, but maybe we won't. And uh, but soon enough, we won't. Is my belief. Uh, and of course, if humans stop, computers can't go on right now. They're, we depend on each other. Uh, but when computers stop being dependent on us, they'll, they'll pursue their own destiny and not worry about us. Yeah, yeah. That's right. it's, it's like the Space Oddity 2001 uh, where I think Dave goes out and the computer doesn't allow him to, Hal doesn't allow him to go back into the spaceship yes. because he had heard that he was trying to sabotage the mission. It's almost like Stanley Kubrick's ideas are coming through now and some of the science fiction is becoming real and, and obviously the intelligence there to make decisions in war, the high-level mm -hmm. things like creating music, creating uh, uh, images and so on. Art is now becoming possible through this, this iteration. So it's, it's quite a worrying time, but obviously there are, there are opportunities that it brings. Uh, my, my last question uh, to you is that you're, you're obviously a movie, Hollywood movie star, as, as I remember oh, from Sneakers. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, so uh, that story. Uh, by the way, I do want to plug my book. Yeah, please, please do. Darwin, so, please do so. Turing, Dawkins, Building a uh, General Theory of Evolution. And uh, I've been writing it for 40 years, and it's always almost years. done. Yeah. It's almost <laughs> done. And I, I plan yeah. to put it up on Amazon. Can't wait to read your book. Yes. And by the way, yeah, very much. If, if, if one of your students wants to, or any of your students wants to email me and ask a copy of the book, I think the first chapter is in pretty good shape. And I mean, the first part. And so I think I would send it if you want to get a taste of what it's about. Um, yeah, that would but, be amazing. And, yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, maybe... Maybe Bill, I'll send you the first part, and yeah, you can give it out to the students along with that picture of Marty. <laughs> that Stunned. would be excellent. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So, uh, yes, okay. So, uh, what was I going to say about? Oh, you were asking Sneakers. about yeah. my Hollywood uh, days. Yeah. yeah. So, um, one day, some guys call me. They're Hollywood guys, and they want to get together and just talk about something. So they come to my office, and these guys uh, were the people who produced and made, directed, I don't know, uh, the movie, what's it called? Not Star Wars, but anyway, it was some very successful movie about a guy who was going to, uh, you know, his computer game starts to actually control the nuclear missiles of the country. He thinks he's just playing a game, but he's actually. All right. And it was a big success. And uh, so they came to me and they said, you know, we're, we're going to make a new movie. And we have two directions and we wanted to discuss it with you. One of the movies is going to be about these people who get uh, 
I don't know what they get. I don't know if it's gabapentin or one of the neuro, uh, you know, mediating chemicals. And if they have Parkinson's, so they're frozen and they've been frozen for a very long time, like 20 years, this is a real story. And then you inject them with this stuff and they free up. They start dancing around and stuff like that. So he said, well, one movie is going to be about that. And the other movie we're thinking of is to make it about crypto. And I said, wow, that story about, you know, these guys waking up sounds to me a whole lot more interesting than crypto. <laughs> so they leave, right? And they produce the movie Awakening, which starred. Awakening, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a really good movie. Yeah, it's amazing. So, and when it's done, uh, they come back, or at least one of them came back. And he says, we're going to do the movie on crypto now. And so uh, I said, oh, yeah. He, they said, you know, would you be a technical consultant or something? <laughs> and I said, well, I, yeah, I guess. And, um, and they said, we'll pay you. And I said, uh, no, I don't want it. I don't want to get paid for this, uh, but I do want something. <laughs> and what I wanted, the movie was starring uh, Robert Redford, okay, big star. And, uh, and uh, I said, uh, I would like to come to the set and uh, have my wife meet and chat with Robert Redford because she would really like that. You know, if you don't know who he is, a very handsome guy. So um, uh, that was the deal we made. And uh, my wife did get to meet Robert Redford, but she was sort of too starstruck to talk and much. Anyway, and so the, the movie came out and uh, as you watch the credits roll by, you know, it says uh, mathematical consultant, Len Adelman. But as I like to say, uh, and I've written down, um, but the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Academy, uh, Academy Awards Committee uh, snubbed me because apparently the <laughs> mathematical consulting Oscar went to somebody else that year. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, anyway. Yeah, Mar yeah Mar Marty Hellman maybe had, the, had a chance. Yeah, Marty got it, right? <laughs> got to walk on the red carpet. Yeah. 